I'll start again. I'm Mike McWilliams, Chief Executive of GNS Science. Welcome and thank you for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to have you here for tonight's public lecture. Um, the occasion of this uh, coincides with the Geoscience Society meeting this week. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we're meeting up at uh, Victoria University. The Geoscience Society uh, meeting these three days is sponsored by, by Victoria and by GNS Science. For us, it's a very special year. Uh, this is our 150th year. Our predecessor organization, the Geological Survey of New Zealand, got its, um, its start in Dunedin in, 18, in April 1865 and moved here later in the year to lodgings that were just up behind the beehive. And if you ever walk behind there, you'll find a, a plaque that signifies that. You can see where the original buildings were. But you're going to hear more about that anyway. I don't, I don't want to get into that. Tonight's, tonight's uh, discussion is a seamless one with two of our scientists about the evolution of GeoNet. Almost everybody in the room, I'm sure, knows about GeoNet. And there's quite a history that goes with it, and you're going to hear that first from Simon and, and then from Ken. So, uh, again, thank you for coming. I'll just give you a brief biography of the two of them, and then they'll just launch into the lecture in, in a seamless, they say, fashion. <laughs> So Simon uh, was close to the epicenter of the 1968 Inangahua earthquake, which I think was about a 7 or 7-1, seven some pretty, pretty large one just to the west of um, uh, Murchison. On his first field trip with the Geological Survey, which was quite some time ago, 1968 as a matter of fact, I can read it here, he'd been fascinated by the effects of earthquakes. And now he's an emeritus scientist at GNS Science and just completed a biography of Sir James Hector who he, he regards as the father, and we all regard him, for that matter, as the father of GNET. I'm sure you're going to hear more about that. And he'll be followed by Ken Gledhill, who's director of GNET, uh, which is our hazards monitoring system. He heads the Geos, uh, hazards monitoring department in the Natural Hazards Division at GNS. He's concentrated mainly on geophysical instrumentation and reporting systems for geological hazards, field studies of big earthquakes, and what the earthquakes and the waves from them can tell us about the crust and the structure of the Earth. And uh, recently he chaired, <clears throat> with the earthquake side of it, he's also chaired the Pacific Tsunami Warning uh, System and done a lot of good things for keeping us all safe, or at least not necessarily keeping us safe, but letting us know when it's not safe. So without further ado, uh, first Simon and then Ken, and once again, thank you for coming. So one of the things that is exciting is we live through um, the early 21st century is to realize just the, the impact of uh, modern technology. Now, it's interesting we have three words that have just come into the Lex New Zealand lexicon on the screen here. EQC, no one had heard, heard of uh, 20 years ago, GNS, and GNET. Uh, these are words, GNET particularly, is a word that almost everyone in New Zealand knows. Now, I hope, I hope we're not going to have an earthquake during my talk, but if we do, people will cover themselves and then it won't be very long before someone grabs for their mobile phone and uh, clicks onto the GeoNet icon uh, to see where the earthquake was and how big it is. And there has, in fact, been a revolution over the last 20 years because before that, you had to ask an expert or you had to wait till the expert was ready to tell you uh, to find out where an earthquake is. Nowadays, you can find out straight away through modern communications, but it's a two-way effect because people are very keen to find out where an earthquake is and what size it is, but they're also very enthusiastic about giving information on what, they've, what they have felt. And one of the big things about GNET is that it's a two-way process and the information that's coming from the public is used to, put to go into the database to show how big the earthquake is. I believe it's the, the biggest and most successful example of public science that we have in New Zealand today. And the, the purpose of this talk is to tell you how this, this has evolved. I'm going to deal with the historical aspects covering the 19th and 20th century, and then Ken is going to deal with the exciting stuff and tell you what's been happening over the last decade. Now, ever since humans came to New Zealand, they have been got the effects of earthquakes and been fascinated by them. Now, the first Maori inhabitants were certainly conscious of earthquakes, but in fact, their buildings were made of wood and they were single-storey, so it, the earthquakes didn't 
as far as we know, have enormous impact. Uh, a wooden building could easily be repaired. But the British, early British settlers thought rather differently. They came from a country where a real building was made of uh, stone, or of, if you couldn't, didn't have stone, you built it of brick. And in fact, some of the earliest industries around Wellington were the brick factories. And so quite quick, the, the first major settlement started in 1840, but by 1848 there were a number of substantial buildings. And it was a terrible shock in the 1848 earthquake, which was centred in Marlborough, where these buildings all suffered uh, enormous damage. And only seven years, uh, seven years later, there was a, another major earthquake in 1855. And this persuaded Wellingtonians in particular, uh, but many New Zealanders, at least in the North Island, uh, to build most of their buildings out of wood uh, for the next few decades. And that's the reason we have the big wooden government buildings, which was one of the, the biggest um, wooden buildings in the south, southern hemisphere, because it was realised that it was dangerous to build uh, a large government building like that out of wood. <coughs> now, I've, I've recently been working on James Hector, who is Mike referred to as, I believe, as the, can be regarded as the father of, of Geonet. He was New Zealand's first government scientist appointed in 1865, and we're celebrating um, the 150th anniversary of his appointment uh, this year. And Hector was appointed to head the geological survey and to find minerals, but he had a very broad idea of the work he was going to do, which was covering the whole of science. And from his arrival, he was fascinated by earthquakes, and he wanted to find out more information about them. Now, Hector, Hector's tentacles spread very widely, in a, just a few years, he was in charge of a number of organisations, including the, um, the Colonial Museum, which is now Te Papa, and the Colonial Botanic Gardens, which is now the Wellington Botanic Gardens. Uh, and, the, um, and one of the things that he was given responsibility for was weather forecasting and uh, weather recording. And this was a wonderful thing for him because, as well as he was interested in weather, but it gave him access to the telegraph system. And so he started gathering information. Oops. Oh, there's a photograph of Hector and Hector sitting on the box and his staff outside the museum, which is just in front of a Bowen Street Bowen State Building today. Hector got access to the, the telegraph system. Uh, because gold had been found in the South Island, it was actually quite more extensive in the South than in the North. But in 1868, um, the first Cook Strait cable went across. And so Hector, from his position in Wellington, was able to gather information from all over the South Island. Um, and it was a few years before the, the telegraph went through to Auckland. But he realised that this was an opportunity to gather earthquake information. And so he gave instructions to the telegraph operators that if they felt an earthquake, they were to immediately record the time and to telegraph him. And so he was able to gather information instantly from all over the country. Um, and this was, was unique um, in the world. And there's a lovely quote here that's taken from the, the magazine Nature, which was then in its infancy. And Hector wrote to his friend and mentor in Britain, Sir Joseph Hooker, to tell him about how he was recording earthquakes in New Zealand. And Hooker put this into Nature. Uh, saying how Dr. Hector of the Geological Survey has been using um, the Telegraph Network to gather information. In his last letter, he writes as follows. Not long ago, one operator asked another, 200 miles distance. Did you feel that? You got the answer, no. What? Yes, there it is. All in a breath, so to speak. Um, <coughs> interestingly, Hector gathered the information um, and it was reported every year in the annual return of weather, uh, weather statistics. So there wasn't a great deal of info. He didn't have the opportunity to make a lot of use of it, the data, but we have a very good record of 19th century earthquakes and where they were felt all around New Zealand. Now, one of the things Hector was very keen to do was to get a seismograph. But unfortunately, that wasn't easy because it wasn't something you could buy in those days. Um, it was still very much in the developmental phase. And he was in touch with a scientist called John Milne, who was one of the earliest developers of the seismograph, 
who was based in Japan. And Milne sent him a, uh, sent him a plan that he got a Wellington jeweler to make Wellington's, or New Zealand's first seismograph. And very sadly, there are no plans exist, nor are there any records. But the results of the information that he got of the seismograph are recorded in the newspapers quite regularly. Whenever there was a big earthquake, people went to ask James Hector. And here he is. This is out of the Evening Post in 1888, talking about the effect of the earthquake and that the telegraph operators had said there were three shocks, but Dr. Hector said there was only two. Um, and so this is, this is the information you, uh, you used, or you, or you believed. But the point I want to make is this is the beginning of what I call the guru period of earthquake information. Uh, you could only get the information if you had someone that could interpret the records and then would tell you what happened. So you were very dependent on waiting for that information to be available, and you were dependent on the expertise of the observer too. Now, um, in the 1890s, uh, John Milne had developed his seismographs further. Um, he'd moved from Japan back to England, and he was very influential and managed to set up a worldwide network of seismographs, and the government was persuaded to buy two of them in 1898, and one was installed in Christchurch, and the other one was installed in Wellington. And we're very lucky that this Milne seismograph has been uh, preserved today, and it's still, still out at GNS, um, and in, to the, in today's terms, it's, it's fairly primitive, but it recorded, here is the earthquake recording as a wavy, wavy line, and Hector was able to, and his successors, um, were able to go and look at the machine and tell what they could about the earthquake. Now, th that, um, it wasn't easy to, there wasn't rapid communication between Wellington and Christchurch in those days anyway. Um, so they used to report the earthquakes uh, more or less independently. Now, one would hope that this was the beginning of a period of great progress in seismology when we had two two seismographs from a worldwide network. In fact, it was exactly the opposite. It was a period of quite long complacency um, because after the 1855 earthquake, there were no other earthquakes in New Zealand, or well, one or two damaging earthquakes, but no one was killed uh, after, after that period for, um, for about 60 years. And so um, there was no great priority to do much on seismology. And in fact, the use, for many years, there was a statement in the New Zealand yearbook saying that earthquakes in New Zealand are rather a matter of scientific interest than a subject for alarm. Um, they stopped putting it in, their, in the yearbook in 1926, fortunately. In fact, my own family fell into this complacency. Here is our family house in Grant Road, uh, built of brick and tiles. And the garden at the back is very steep and has been terraced. I had no idea when I was growing up that we're right on the scarp of the Wellington Fault there. And, and I do wonder what's going to happen when there is a decent, uh, a big earthquake in Wellington. But there was a big change in public perception in 1929. This was the first major earthquake for a long time that a substantial number of, uh, a big area was affected in the centre of New Zealand and a number of people were killed. And so it was quickly decided that New Zealand had to boost its effort in seismology and a number of seismographs were ordered uh, to be placed around the country. Now in those days, the seismograph needed to be maintained, needed uh, fairly constant maintenance, and so the first seismographs and those that came later were put in places like power stations, where there were operators who could uh, change the records and maintain it as part of their routine. And they had just got the first seismographs installed in time for the 1931 Napier earthquake. And unfortunately, that didn't work particularly well because all the seismographs were overloaded. So you just got lots of wavy lines. But that was the beginning of a period of realization that New Zealand needed a proper network of seismographs. And in fact, the next 50 years in New Zealand is really a time of consolidation, of expanding the earthquake network, and then by the time expertise had been gained in understanding the earthquakes and starting to 
interpret the scientific significance of them and finding that New Zealand earthquakes were not random, that they occurred in certain, certain zones. And in the 1960s, the seismograph network was expanded uh, because of pressure to be able to uh, uh, detect nuclear explosions. Uh, firstly, to be able to tell whether something was a nuclear explosion or an, an earthquake and to locate it. Now, as Mike mentioned, I just started with the Geological Survey at the time of the 1968 Ananga Hura earthquake and was involved in the subsequent investigations. Um, oh, sorry, to, this, this was the, um, the extent of the network at around, oh, it was in 1980. There was a fairly even distribution of stations around New Zealand and the seismologists could uh, locate the earthquakes with a, within New Zealand with a fair degree of precision. But there was quite a long time lag um, because this is a seismograph at the, t in, um, at the Seismological Observatory in Wellington at the time of the Anangahua earthquake. Um, the seismograph went off the, uh, went off the scale. You can see the ink splatter along here. This was a photograph in the, in the Evening Post in 1968. But in terms of seismographs today, it was fairly, fairly primitive. It was not actually greatly different from the Milne seismograph, just that the mechanics of it were a lot more sophisticated. But it also required, having got the record, it then required expert seismologists to interpret it and to compare it with other records before you could get any idea where the earthquake was or how big it was. Things were getting more sophisticated in terms of earthquake analysis, but it was still slow and time consuming. And it was quite a major change in 1992 when the DSIR went out of existence and the GNS and other CRIs began. And this is a, the statement made by Warwick Smith, who was the senior seismologist, who was the guru who used to appear for many years on TV, telling people where the earthquake was. Our greatest frustration is the public misconception that the observatory is there to give rapid information on earthquakes. Haste is difficult when data is recorded on remote seismograph. Recorded on remote seismographs has to be mailed in for analysis. This is the state of things when I arrived in 1982, basically. Uh, and what, whoops, not back too far. And that statement by Warwick Smith, who was my boss when I first arrived, was basically directed at this beast. And I love this beast. I was the principal designer of this beast, um, along with Mike Randall. And under that panel there, there's a tape that is a bit like a VHS videotape. But that tape contained, could store 25 megabytes of data. I don't know, that's about a, you know, a word file size nowadays. Um, so things have changed quite a lot. But basically if you look at the top there, we developed that in the late, um, eight, well mid to late 80s. And so for the Edgecombe earthquake, we actually had digital records from that beast and we thought we were really doing extremely well. Uh, and you notice that we were still operating these up to 2005. So, if we jump forward just a few years to 2000 and then compare with 2015, which I believe is roughly where we are now, we see that there was a huge increase. Basically in 2000 with funding from the Earthquake Commission, we had established four satellite communication sites that were bringing data in in real time. And uh, it was all working really well and we were really excited. So, just jumping a little bit, what is GNN? I don't actually need to probably tell you what GNN is, but there's a couple of things up there that I want to underline. One is the integrated. So unlike most countries that have their earthquakes in this organisation, their, their um, GPS in this organisation, their volcanoes in this organisation, etc, etc, New Zealand sticks them all in, not just in one organisation, but one facility, which is GNN. So that's one thing. The second thing is all those perils we actually cover. So they're kind of one thing, really. Question and answer on GNN. Um, 
the important thing, 2001 we kicked off, um, largely funded by the Earthquake Commission, and this is really, really important. Uh, the vision of the leaders of the Earthquake Commission and, dare I say, Genius Science in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s means, mean that we had Geniet in place before the action really started in 2009, 2010. That is really important. The other important thing it is, it is, it is that partnership between government organisations and effective partnership. So that's really important. And dare I say it, I'm not sure I can say this sitting in MB, but it's a high-tech project in New Zealand that hasn't failed. It's actually <laughs> done very well. So this is the seismograph network. The, the red dots are what we call national network stations. They have both what we call broadband sensors and strong motion sensors. So you can see in the, in the, in the vault there, the, the sort of paint can size thing, that's a broadband sensor, and the little one beside it is the strong motion sensor. And most of the national network sites goes, bought, the data comes back through satellite. So um, it's done for robustness. The little dots are the infill, and you see that they kind of actually map out hazard or even risk, if you like. The areas that we knew, like above the subduction zone, that's about 25 kilometres below my feet, where the Pacific plate goes down under the Australian plate along the east coast of the North Island. The volcanic, you can see all the volcanic centres sticking out because we've got sensors all over them. Um, and you notice one feature is the South Island's pretty poorly covered in comparison with the North Island. To complement that, we have what we call a strong motion network. And this is to get ground truth where people live and work and it's to get the heavy shaking events. So the first network is really to locate the earthquakes. The second network is really to get ground truth where people live and work. Just note that the, the beast there you see in the box is homegrown. Uh, it came out of a PhD thesis uh, at Canterbury University and we're still using it. Earthquake waves, there's two kinds. We imaginatively, imaginatively call them the P wave for primary wave and the S wave for secondary wave, and they travel at different speeds. The P wave faster, you measure the, the timing of them both on a lot of stations, and you do some uh, basically geometry, trigonometry, and out pops where the location of the earthquake is, to how far down on the ground it is. Of course, uh, we don't do that nowadays, the, the computers do it. And we feed that data out to everybody uh, very quickly. So uh, here's, for example, what we actually do. So this is straight from our website. And what we do is we publish everything as the process happens. So what happens first is there's enough information come in for us to get a rough idea where the earthquake is and we publish the first location. And that is usually at about one minute. Quite often less than one minute. And then we publish, as more data comes in, we carry on iterating and we publish. Finally, a seismologist gets out of bed, staggers to his computer and actually checks that and publishes uh, the final sort of location for that event. And you see that process took about 10 minutes. So one minute we have something out that gives us a pretty good idea of what's going on. 10 minutes, we've nailed it. So uh, I like to think of this thing called the Geniet community. And we were a part of the Geniet community, but it kind of didn't really exist very much before the Canterbury earthquake started. Uh, we were boffins that were doing something interesting. We had a following, but there was relatively few people. But then the earthquakes started and everybody wanted to know about them. 
and it changed everything. So ultimately we have developed uh, methods of communicating this information very quickly to everybody, but also letting people kind of talk back to us. And, and that's been um, what Simon talked about with uh, citizen science. We've embraced it, basically. And it's really uh, one of the strengths, I think, of GNN now. But it's, we've got all those instruments out there, but we've also got a lot of people that report what's happening when it happens. Um, and of course, social media. It's uh, an interesting phenomenon but is one of those vehicles to let people tell you how they feel. Um, I call it, particularly Twitter, which I'll show you in a minute, the whinge medium. <laughs> but um, if you imagine all that time ago in 2011, we were actually still locating every failed earthquake manually. That means a seismologist was <coughs> looking at wiggles on a screen and then pushing the go button. And um, the punters, they got quite um, frustrated with it, how slow we were. And uh, they kept making these statements. <laughs> um, yeah, but this, this game that was called <laughs> Geonet Bingo, or whatever you like to call it, grew up as well, where people would be guessing. And, and that become almost as important as everything else. And uh, they were actually quite nice as well. But the thing is, we have no idea really how important that was to people. And I've met people who have actually told me that actually knowing that somebody was looking into their earthquakes was made the, it sort of made it bearable. So it was kind of an important factor in the, in the whole thing. So that's the GNET community at work, if you like. It's a, it's a community of people. I think of it as ourselves, those that run GNET, those broader group within GNET science that make sure GNET is possible, um, all the scientists that work on the data that we produce, and everybody in New Zealand, and I'm afraid internationally as well. Or not afraid, really. <laughs> so, just a demonstration, kind of, of how, <laughs> how this is developed. This is what we call the Chardonnay earthquake. It was a magnitude 3.9 <laughs> in the Haraki Gulf, felt by a huge number of Aucklanders, and it still remains the most reported earthquake in Genia history. <laughs> <laughs> and just to give you an idea is, is basically it's, it's just one metric and it's not actually a very good metric but hits on the website. How many people hit the website? Um, and uh, we go back to Dino the dinosaur. I don't know if who knows about Dino the dinosaur, but in the early days of GNF, one of our technicians pasted a tiny di dinosaur in front of the webcam on White Island. And this is the only time the GNF website was totally taken down, because people were, it was what they call slash dot all over the planet, and people were coming to see this, and the size of the file was such that it killed our website. It's the only time it's killed our website. And uh, so that was 10 hits per second, believe it or not. That was pretty brutal. Um, and then there was a series of upper hut earthquakes in 2005. And that got up to 300 hits per second. Uh, the Darfield earthquake took us over that 5,000 mark. And then, usually a deep earthquake is about the worst because it's very widely felt. A lot of people hit the website, and that gets us to about 16,000. But being a scientist, I always wanted to invent a unit, so I invented this one called a Dino. <laughs> one Dino is 10 hits per second, so I've tried to get the Internet Society to actually uh, approve this, but no way. <laughs> anyway, I carry on, and you notice that uh, we published, I think that we published this in our um, 
annual report of how many um, hits we have, and it's usually over a billion a year now. It's one metric, it's one measure. But it's kind of plateaued, that hit count, in some ways, because of the smartphone app. And the smartphone app means that the information is available incredibly quickly. So I'm just going to wander over here. And in the smartphone app, this map here basically reflects the shaking at the sites at all our sites in New Zealand in the last hour. So when you get an earthquake, it shows up like that. If you haven't already got a smartphone, buy a smartphone first. <laughs> if you, the first thing you do is you download the GNET app. If you've already got the GNET app, update it. And uh, it's now got a menu on it. And there's a few interesting features. That one I think I, I just love because I can at any time pull out my cell phone and see what all the instruments are doing. Um, but, uh, and you can set how you want the notifications. You still get the list of earthquakes like you already did. And that's, we're trying to move away from magnitude because magnitude is actually a poor indicator of how earthquakes affect people. So we're trying to move to, basically it's a, it's a word version of modified Michele. Um, and the other thing, just released, is you can now report what you feel. For the purists, um, you don't just get the pictures, you can actually scroll down and there's all the words, and you can memorise those words so you know which picture is the right picture. So what we're doing is the ultimate in citizen science. We're asking the punters to actually tell us what they've felt. We're not asking them a whole lot of questions and then double guessing what they're trying to tell us. We're actually giving them the information and we're asking them. So GNET now produces an incredible amount of data. Or should that be data? I'd never get that one right. Um, and if just the highlighted bits at the bottom, I mean it's around about 10 gigabytes a day which is a bit more than a double sided DVD or whatever you like to say and about 50 terabytes or so of data there. How can we handle all that? And uh, two words, Moore's Law. And if you don't know what Moore's Law is, you're about to be told. <laughs> Moore's Law says that the number of transistors on a computer chip doubles every 80 months to two years. But the thing about Moore's Law, that in some form it it applies to all technology. So uh, we move data around, but we can now move the data around. The kind of data volumes, if you think back to when I was talking earlier about 25 megabytes, um, and so we had to post the tape in, we move that kind of data around all the time now. And uh, it's easy. So the same thing that is applied to Moore's Law, which is really about computers, also applies to computer storage, and it applies to telecommunications. So we have hubs around the country where the data comes together, and then it is bigger hubs where it comes in to us. And at the moment, we've got Auckland, Taupo, and Wellington. But Processing the data, we just don't have one computer centre or as we used to tell EQC we had two, we had one in Wellington and one in Taupo and that was for redundancy, if one wouldn't work the other wouldn't work. Well those days are kind of over, we now do what I'd call distributed. So the processing power is distributed and uh, if something fails the way we operate now, we can spin up a replacement in about a quarter of an hour. So it really has changed the way you operate. So this is what you've probably heard talk, people talk about cloud technology. This is cloud technology in action. <coughs> and we send the data everywhere. Uh, for example, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Centre in Hawaii gets 
any of our data they want to use to locate the earthquakes that cause tsunami. And that satellite system I talked about earlier, it actually terminates in a place called Belrose, just out of Sydney. And so the ultimate belts and braces, or the ultimate business continuity plan, is if something happens to cut New Zealand off completely, those international centres can carry on allocating our earthquakes because they'll get it from Sydney. It's been a busy little while. Simon talked about that busy period in the 1800s. There was another one he talked about in um, the 1900s, starting with Anangahur, not Anangahur, sorry, Murchison, about that time. And then, for most of our lifetime, we actually had a very quiet time. Um, 80 years or so from, from um, the 40s through to recently, was very quiet, but no more. To me, it started in um, nine, uh, 2009 with the Dusky Sound earthquake, biggest earthquake in New Zealand <coughs> since the uh, Hawke's Bay earthquake, and then it kicked off with the Canterbury earthquakes, and uh, a few of you in this room, I assume, felt the Cook Strait earthquakes in 2013. So I've deliberately not talked a lot about the Christchurch earthquakes, but I just want to talk a tiny bit about them because it's, it's a matter of scale. Um, kind of uh, everything's relative, so Einstein said anyway. But in this case, it's very relative. So when we looked at uh, the Canterbury, the Christchurch earthquake is the bottom one, Actually, 6.2. It had accelerations. Uh, if you measure the shaking level, they were in places twice the force of gravity. And uh, even in the central business district, it was about one times. The f if you look at the Cook Strait earthquakes, it was about a tenth of that. And I remember being in Thorndon when they happened when one of them happened, it was the one on Friday afternoon that closed Wellington down completely, it felt pretty strong. Well, some of you in this room probably did feel the Christchurch earthquake and can really confirm to us, but to me, imagining something 10 times as bad as that earthquake is, is something. But we know about how bad it was in Christchurch as far as instrumentally, we have ground truth because of GNN. And just to end, I'm going to do a bit of a diversion into uh, to look at our GPS network. You'll notice that the way it's laid out is very similar to the seismograph network. Most of the stations are down the east coast of the North Island. There's a smattering in the South Island and uh, around the volcanoes. And uh, shortly after we, we got the uh, network, or the first stations of the networks going, we noticed those funny squiggles. And I'll just highlight them so that it's kind of obvious. That very first one there. So these are showing how the pos a position on the Earth's surface is changing with time. And you see, normally it's, it's going in one direction and then it jumps back. And then it does it again and it jumps back. And in fact, um, if, if you analyse this a bit more, this happens about every 18 months to two years in this spot up near Gisborne. These are what we call slow slip events. These are like earthquakes, but they take a couple of weeks. So what does that tell us about that plate interface, that biggest fault in New Zealand, which is, you know, 25 kilometres beneath my feet here, 25 kilometres beneath all of our feet and um, right along the east coast of the North Island. This is really what's happening. So what we believe is the, the red bit is where it's locked, it's sticking. 
And when it sticks like that, basically you're building up tension in the system, and sooner or later you're going to release that in an earthquake. Down deeper it's slipping, so that's the blue bit. In between, it's kind of uh, sometimes sticking, sometimes slipping, and that's where these slow slip events happen. And they, they come in all sorts of sizes, and we have about 20 of them that we've mapped over the last uh, 15 years or so. They, they can take, as I say, two weeks, they can take months, they can take over a year. They're telling us a lot about that plate interface and people are trying to work out what they're telling us and I'm not actually going to try and pretend that I actually know but people are studying this. And this is one of the most exciting findings of the GENIC program. And it is about earthquakes, it is about this whole process, this us living on a plate boundary. So what I'm showing here, and those spots that get brighter and move and so forth, uh, it's decimal years, which uh, some geodesists thought was a good idea, I'm sure. The little prick marks, they are actually earthquakes near the plate boundary, and the other are these slow slip events. And I'll leave it going because there's one that hopefully will come up soon that I think is really spectacular, if I haven't already missed it. No, there it is. See how it starts and then it walks up the coast? So this is the kind of information you can get if you have enough data. Now my vision would be we need 10 times as many stations as we've got now. And um, obviously that is a dream, but I think with the way technology is going it will happen. May not on my watch, but it will happen. So I do want to thank sincerely my sponsors, um, all of them. <coughs> Particularly, um, I've added in there as well as uh, EQC, which is our primary sponsor. And I say, I'll repeat that the vision of the uh, people in the late 90s, the leaders of these organisations in the late 90s and early 2000s are impressive and we owe them a lot because that we were set up so well for those earthquakes that happen later. Um, Land Information New Zealand actually are a part of this because they fund a lot of the GPS, well, some of the GPS stations.